Welcome to this video where I discuss the different methods for operating reservoirs. And I get these methods from the Corps of Engineers Manual EM 1110-2-3600. Um, that is online, so you can Google it if you want to read more about this. Um, in this video, I'm going to be discussing how these methods impact um, the way that we deal with water that's actually in the flood zone. I go into the different zones in a reservoir in other videos, so I won't spend a lot of time with it. Um, but here you have your inactive zone, your conservation zone, your flood zone, and then above your flood zone, you have your surcharge zone. So we're going to be dealing with the flood zone here, how water is treated in that zone under these different methods, and also what type of impacts to the downstream area can we see based on these different methods. So in a method A reservoir, we're maximizing the storage of runoff and limiting releases to lower the downstream stages and damages as much as possible during each flood event. And probably the most important word in that sentence is each, and that's why I have it underlined, which means that you will be providing protection for small and medium-sized floods. But one of the criticisms that you can get is, well, you, if you do that, then you can run out of storage if you have a large subsequent flood. And that is true, that's an acknowledgement of that method. So just as long as, as it's understood about downstream regulating stages is that um, we'll, we'll look at this in plan view. And here you have a downstream regulating stage and it's marked by the star here. And basically whatever's going on at that location can have an impact on what you can release from your upstream reservoirs. Right, it's a very simple way of making sure that it's understood what a uh, uh, what is determining the releases from the method A reservoirs. So here we're looking at actual data from an actual event for a method A reservoir. And there's a lot going on here, so I'll try to break this down. On the bottom plot, we have inflow and outflow, inflow given by the blue line and outflow given by the green line. And so we're going to be looking at this plot and then the upper plot, which is the pool elevation, kind of at the same time. So with each one of these rises, so here we can see that we have a significant rise in inflow that occurred in late March. You can see that you get a rise in the pool elevation. And it's because your inflow is greater than your outflow. Towards the end of March, early April, another rise in inflow, which causes the pool to rise even further. And then by the time you get to mid-April, you get another rise. And that's because your pool, uh, and that caused your pool to actually get not only to the top of flood pool, but above the top of the flood pool. And it also caused an increase in your release as shown by the outflow. So that means that the spillway had to be open. We got to the top of the flood pool, got into the surcharge pool, and had a spillway release during that time period. So one other thing to notice is that your green line, sometimes it would go, looks like it went down to zero. In that case, there was most likely some local flooding concerns that caused them to have to take it down to zero. But for the most part, they're at this minimum flood release. Uh, for most of March and April, with the exception of this spillway event, or this spillway uh, uh, discharge. The reason why, so you might be wondering, well, why weren't you making larger releases during that time period? And the reason is, is because it's a method A reservoir, which is being guided by the downstream regulating stage. I show the regulating stage here using this red dash line. And you can see that we're above regulating stage for basically all of March, almost all of March and April, which means that we're only able to do these minimum flood releases unless um, we are required to make a spillway release, because if not, it would go over the top of an open spillway gate. So we get to the top of the flood pool and then we have to uh, then make this release. So that's a good example of a method A reservoir. And again, the reason why I wanted to look at method A, method B, and method C for this particular event is because you can probably understand it. You can get some criticism to say, well, had you been more aggressive with your releases, then maybe you could have avoided that spillway release. And that, that is a true statement. 
So that brings us to the method B reservoir. And it says that the reservoir releases are made strictly according to the release schedule. And in this case, it says of the inflow design flood. But I just really want you to think that we're really looking at trying to provide this protection for these very large floods and not so being so worried about small and medium flood benefits if you're operating according to method B. And the way you do that is that you do a continual release up to a specified amount uh, to make sure that you have reservoir flood storage in case you get a very large flood. The very simple schematic to show that concept um, your red dash line is your release and your blue line is your inflow. So in this case, we can assume that we're at the top of conservation pool. We're starting to get inflow coming in and we're making a determination on what to do with that inflow. Well, on the method B, let's say that you said it, well, anything below a thousand is going to be passed. So what we do is we just pass inflow and maintain our pool at top of conservation. But then by the time we get over a thousand, then that's when storage is actually going to occur because we're only going to release uh, 1,000 CFS at that point. That's kind of a very simple way of looking at a method B reservoir. But let's actually go take a look at that same event and see, well, do we get a better result with a method B reservoir from operating that way? Now, this is just a qualitative analysis where I just did sketches so that they're not the scale, the timing might not be quite right, but I, I think it does give you a good uh, explanation of um, the difference between method A and method B. So same inflow occurred, but what we say is that we're going to then pass anything that is below this gray line, right? That's going to be our constant release through this. So we can see that in only two cases, this that occurred in or this uh, inflow that occurred was the latter part of May of March rather, and then also this that occurred in around mid-April are going to create rises in your pool. So here you can see you get a rise here, and you also get a rise here, right? And it also means that your maximum discharge is only going to be. Well, I, actually, again, this is somewhat qualitative, but maybe that's 30,000 or whatever it is, which means that it would be less than your, I'm going to have to go back up. So it looks like our maximum outflow here for the actual event was about 55,000. So you might be tempted to believe, well, that obviously gives you a better result. You avoid your spillway release because my pool never does get to the top of the flood pool. However, let's see what's happening at the downstream location. So in this case, we have a higher release. Um, so again, remember that we were able to capture almost all of this inflow peak. Uh, but in this case, we're not capturing the all of that inflow peak. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to have a higher stage during this first peak. Now, um, you know, we are creating our space, right? We're creating our space here um, with the, a larger release, but we are able to then avoid that spillway release and also decrease the second peak that occurred at our downstream location. However, our first peak was larger than our second peak, and we actually made the first peak even larger. So in this case, operating to a method A reservoir actually gave you a better result. Um, I'm not saying that it will always give you a better result because whether or not it gives you a better result is going to be event dependent. The, uh, um, so what you might be thinking is, well, we don't really know whether or not a method A or a method B reservoir is going to give us a better result since it is event dependent. Um, and so then the thought might be, well, you know, we, we still want to have some benefit for these small and medium flood events, but I also want to make sure that we have, um, or at least attempt to have some space available if we get a large subsequent event. And that's where this method C reservoir comes in, where it's really just a combination of method A and method B. So you can see in the lower part of your flood zone, you can then operate this as a method A reservoir, but then once you get to a certain point in your reservoir, 
then you can say, well, I want to now be more aggressive with my releases and switch over to a method B reservoir. But again, whether or not you're going to get a better result doing it that way, it's still going to be dependent upon the event. Um, now, again, I, I didn't really put any information in here about method C or show method C. I, I thought I could just discuss um, what a method C might look like by really just looking at these two events here. So if you still wanted to get this result, then you could say, well, um, if I was operating this according to a method A reservoir, maybe up to about this particular elevation, then I could have preserved that benefit that I got or that um, result at the downstream uh, regulating station. But if I wanted to then be more aggressive after that point, then I, I may have had a slower recession at my downstream regulating stage because now I'm being more aggressive with my releases. And so I may have been able to preserve this uh, result that I got using method A techniques, but then also avoided the spillway release by then becoming more aggressive and using the method B releases. But then again, um, it, it is event dependent and whether or not you can actually preserve this is going to be somewhat dependent upon when you switch over from method A to method B or what elevation you use to switch over from method A to, to method B. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit more understanding of method A, method B, and method C reservoirs, and then the uh, trade-offs that you can see uh, in these different methods. So if you found this helpful, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I'll be putting uh, more of these videos out. Um, and also let me know if you have any topics of videos that, that you would like to see. Thanks for watching this one.